Welcome to APTN National News Weekend. I'm Daryl Stranger. The first doses of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine arrived in Canada a week ago. In a press conference earlier this week, government officials gave vague answers as to when Canada and First Nations can expect to be vaccinated. The vaccine touched down Saturday evening at various locations around the country. This is the first shipment of 30,000 doses. Canada says they will be receiving 249,000 doses by the end of the month. And when asked for details on further shipments, Minister of Procurement Anita Anand said that is still being worked out. She also didn't know when remote Indigenous communities would get the vaccine. We know that the Pfizer vaccine is very fragile, requiring minus 70 degrees Celsius um, refrigeration or freezer temperatures. And so uh, we are hopeful that additional vaccines as they come online and are approved by Health Canada and that are able to be stored at less cold temperatures um, will be easier to transport to those communities. And by all means, we will be making sure that those communities have the refrigeration and freezer capacity necessary to ensure that vulnerable populations are indeed well served. And as one of the COVID-19 vaccines makes it to provinces this week and into the arms of frontline workers and the elderly, a conversation is playing out online with many including Indigenous people across the country voicing their concerns over this vaccine. For some it brings up concerns of pandemic pasts, but Indigenous leaders, health professionals and historians are urging people to do the proper research. Brittany Hobson explains. This was a scene in Quebec and Ontario where healthcare workers and the elderly eagerly lined up to be the first to receive the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine in the country. And while many view this as a momentous occasion, some are voicing their concerns. All it takes is a quick scroll through Facebook or Twitter to find people are divided when it comes to taking the vaccine. This is especially prevalent in Indigenous communities. One person writes, I feel that the vaccines are being given out to First Nations to use us as lab rats. So in case anything goes wrong, the Canadians won't have to suffer. Another writes, I don't trust the government at all. Hashtag genocide. On the other end, some are taking caution. It depends on your level of risk and how much information you have on the safety and efficiency of the vaccine, one person writes. While another says, I'm not about to run out and get it ASAP, but if I see it's working out well, I have nothing against it. These conversations aren't surprising to Michelle Dreger, a MET professor of community health sciences at the University of Manitoba. Dreger previously did H1N1 research with Urban First Nations and Métis. These comments were similar to what she heard at that time. There was a considerable amount of distrust with respect to the pandemic H1N1 vaccine, particularly when it was initially rolled out. And a lot of the concerns that were being raised by um, participants was that they felt they felt that the vaccine was being tested on them um, to make sure that it was safe before it would be given to the white guys. In the case of H1N1 in Manitoba, Indigenous people were prioritized to receive the vaccine after severe outbreaks in the Island Lake region. But this decision didn't provide the relief it was meant to because people feared they were being tested on. I guess when you think about historically, when have people of First Nations, Inuit and Métis ancestry ever been prioritized to receive anything good before? So some of the, 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 the concerns um, that citizens were expressing uh, made sense in that context. History is a basis for many people's fears. In the 18th century, there are stories of settlers giving smallpox infested blankets to Native Americans. In sanatoriums, residents spoke of medical testing and experiments. And most recently, a class action lawsuit was launched after several Indigenous women say they were sterilized without their consent. And if people are just Dr. Veronica McKinney it, says these instances and in ongoing systemic racism within the healthcare system need to be addressed. And I think again it has to do with the treatment that they've had through the years. And, and it, it kind of speaks to me more about how I wonder if we're actually doing a a good enough job on education and it's not just you know education isn't it's good for you take it but really helping people to understand what is this and what are some of those little nuances the assembly of manitoba chiefs hosts weekly facebook live meetings on the pandemic 
The vaccine has been top of mind for the past two weeks. I think the risk of Indigenous people being rushed into taking the vaccine would be um, significantly lower than any delays in getting the vaccine available for Indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples are considered a priority group for the COVID-19 vaccine. But it could be weeks before communities see it because of the limited amounts and storage requirements. In the meantime, leaders are urging those with concerns to seek out reliable sources of information. There's a lot of misinformation out there, and so I really encourage our people to uh, look at these scientific studies, to look at the scientific journals, to try and wade through them to really understand what the facts are. So far, the Pfizer vaccine is the only one approved by Health Canada. The federal government announced they are on track to approve the Moderna vaccine. Health Canada has said people with allergies to any ingredients in the Pfizer vaccine should refrain from getting it. Brittany Hobson, ABTN National News. In Labrador, the Nunatchivu government is raising concerns over the rising levels of methyl mercury downstream from a hydroelectric dam and the energy company's inaccurate predictions. Angel Moore reports. It's been one year since the reservoir at Muskrat Falls filled to capacity and the methyl mercury levels downstream are rising. According to Nalcor Energy, the government-owned corporation, the levels are within safe limits, but they declined to be interviewed. Minister Greg Flowers of the Nunatsiwut government does not trust Nalcor's predictions. The vegetation and this, this soil that uh, after the flooding, the, the concentration of methyl mercury is a lot higher than, uh, than Nalcor is predicting. The controversial hydroelectric dam on Lower Churchill River was met with backlash from community members. They feared the ecosystem was at risk from methylmercury forming in the reservoir. Methylmercury is created when organic matter is flooded. It is also poisonous to wildlife. And now, with levels rising, the Nunatsivit government is proposing a joint monitoring program with the provincial government. I, I don't think we, as Indigenous people, can trust what no course is, and so that's why we certainly like to have have the province on board and, and, and ourselves to monitor. Flower says traditional foods harvested are safe for human consumption, for now, and a trusted monitoring system will predict the impacts for coming generations. Angel Moore, APTN, National News, Chibuktuk, Halifax. We have to take a short break, but still to come, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission released its final report five years ago. We'll have the details of what the commissioners are saying next. Welcome back to APT National News Weekend. I'm Daryl Stranger. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report came out five years ago, but former TRC commissioners are criticizing the Liberal government, saying the Feds are dragging their feet on implementing the calls to action. The Prime Minister responded to these allegations, and Jamie Pashagumskum spoke with a professor at Carleton University on their response to the calls to action. Former TRC commissioners, like Murray Sinclair, are skeptical of federal progress. But on Tuesday, Justin Trudeau said his government is making headway. As much as Ottawa might want uh, to put forward the answers and move forward very quickly, it can't be that way. We need to do this in partnership, hand-in-hand uh, -hand with Indigenous communities who need to determine their future. Trudeau said his job is to support, resource, and accompany Indigenous people on the path to reconciliation. Meanwhile, Ottawa's Carleton University is replying to the calls to action. One of them has been running for the past two years. The university calls them Indigenous Collaborative Learning Bundles. They are actually living bundles of knowledge. So we have a, a lecture provided by myself or other Indigenous faculty at Carleton or elsewhere or community uh, knowledge experts. And then there's also uh, an interview with a knowledge keeper, Indigenous knowledge keeper, that really uh, brings the content of the lecture um, to life. Carleton is applying the bundles in over 50 classes this term across all disciplines. 
Professor Keante Horn Miller feels it's her responsibility to bring this knowledge to the rest of the university. I come from a people that are new, di no diplomacy. Uh, my people, the Kanyakahaga, are part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and we have a long-standing practice of building bridges between our culture, our nation, and uh, other nations. So Hornmiller said way. they are ensuring that Carleton University graduates leave with the skills to have the difficult conversations around reconciliation, which comes straight out of the TRC's calls to action. The call is really start to learn the history, start to engage with that difficult history and start to, start to, start to fix it, fix those relations. Horn Miller says the learning bundles address the lack of knowledge of Indigenous peoples. And as far as the university is concerned, that work is ongoing. Jimmy Pashigumska, APTN National News, Ottawa. And staying with the TRC five-year anniversary, here's more on what the commissioners had to say about the report five years later. For the first time since the release of the Truth and Reconciliations Commission's final report, all three commissioners were together, albeit virtually. The commissioners joined EPTN in focus for a special show five years after the release of their final report. They say they reconvened to renew the sense of urgency, purpose and unity in the calls to action. Together today we remind you that reconciliation belongs to each and every one of us as individuals, as governments and as citizens. Reconciliation is not dead unless we kill it through our own inaction. The TRC spent six years traveling around Canada to hear from the people who had been taken from their families as children and placed into residential schools. It is estimated that over 150,000 children attended residential schools for over a century. It was the Commission's role to document these stories. Garnet Anjikaneb is a survivor of residential school and is cautiously optimistic about what the future might hold. I, I see a lot of hope, but uh, you know, and, and, and as significant milestones have happened, uh, I've also seen uh, some signs of change. And uh, I really uh, put a lot of faith in those signs of change. And so I have to count on that. But uh, as I say, uh, it's been really slow, I think, in, in, in so many ways. Murray Sinclair says change is not supposed to happen overnight, but would have liked to see more progress at this point. We did not and do not expect change to happen overnight. It is, however, very concerning to us as commissioners that five years later, the federal government still does not have a tangible plan for how they will work towards implementing the calls to action. Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations Carolyn Bennett says the establishment of a National Council for Reconciliation is top of mind. I think as we've heard from the commissioners that, that we need to accelerate the pace of setting up that National uh, Council for Reconciliation so that there is that arm's length body of, of really uh, the accountability not only for the 94 calls to action but also all aspects of, of reconciliation. Everyone agrees that it is not too late to come together as one and work towards reconciliation and honor the truth. All the, the, the kids entering kindergarten now who have their first orange shirt day, that at those next anniversaries know exactly what we're talking about and, and will never let anything like this happen again. We want to hear what you think about the TRC's final report five years later. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca, find us online at aptnnews.ca, and on youtube.com slash aptnnews. Also, you can follow APTN News on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for more Indigenous news. Braden Bushby has been found guilty of manslaughter in the death of 34-year-old 34, 34 Anishinaabekwe Barbara Kentner. Kentner died in July 2017, five months after Bushby threw a trailer hitch at her from a moving vehicle. For more, here's the Globe and Mail's Willow Fiddler from Thunder Bay with our Brittany Hobson. Thanks for joining us today, Willow. What was the reaction to today's guilty verdict? There was, you know, a lot of um, hugging and tears outside of the courtroom today, but it's, um, you know, it's pretty clear that this is just a small 
a piece of justice um, for the Kettner family and um, Indigenous communities in this region. What did the judge have to say leading up to the guilty verdict? So there was, you know, a few different things with this case. It was really about, um, you know, there was no disputing that Braden Bushby threw the trailer hitch um, that hit Barbara Kettner in the stomach, you know, causing her small intestine to rupture. And six months later, she died. What the Crown had to prove that is that, um, you know, he knew by throwing that trailer hitch, it was going to cause uh, damage, that, that, that it would hurt somebody. And um, so the justice, uh, you know, had said she was satisfied that the Crown was able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and she, you know, used the uh, testimony and the evidence from the forensic pathologist who listed Barbara's cause of death as, um, there, there was actually three different things that were listed there. One was a, a pneumonia, a, a second was a peritonitis, which is some sort of infection. Um, but, but ultimately she, she said, you know, none of that would have happened and, and if she hadn't been injured by that trailer hitch. So, um, you know, the, ju the justice was, was satisfied that, um, that that was the case and, and uh, yeah, that was part of the verdict. Is Braden Bushby now in custody, and when can we expect sentencing to take place? Braden Bushby remains out on custody on conditions. Um, he's spent very little time in jail since all of this has happened. Um, you know, part of his conditions is that he has to stay uh, with his surety, who is his uh, mother at this point, I believe. Um, and sentencing is now scheduled for February the 9th at which time the justice um, will take some time following uh, that hearing, which she says will uh, last probably a full day. She said she's going to need some time to reflect uh, on, on that and before she comes back with, with a sentence for uh, Mr. Bushby. Well, thank you so much, Willow, for taking the time to sit down and chat with us. Thanks for having me, Brittany. One of the chiefs responsible for implementing an investigative review of sexual orientation and gender-based discrimination within the Assembly of First Nations is speaking out about what caused her to push for an examination of its current regulations. Chief Doris Bill says for years she's heard complaints of discriminatory remarks about women in the AFN, like derogatory comments about their age and appearance, and says the Me Too movement also influenced her decision. It's been a male-dominated environment for a long, long time. Perhaps some of them don't see it, you know? Perhaps some of them just ignore it. Uh, perhaps they don't want to see it. However, we came together for a common purpose, and that purpose is to have a work environment that is free of sexual orientation and gender-based discrimination. Last week, the Assembly passed a resolution that would see three independent investigators take on the review. A final report will be expected within nine months and would include recommendations for change. We have to take one more break, but still ahead, how some Northerners are still dealing with data caps and overages despite unlimited internet recently being rolled out. We'll have that after the break. Welcome back. Unlimited internet has just recently been rolled out in a few communities in northern Canada. And while it's a privilege for some, for most northerners, data caps and overage chargers continue to be the norm. Our Sarah Connors reports. Everybody's happy in the house, which is good. Like many northerners, TJ Stewart's family has been using the internet more because of COVID restrictions. Well, I've been using way more since COVID started, staying home all the time. But because of data caps, the Casca man has to be careful about how much internet his family uses. We had a bill run $200 over. That's because I have a daughter too, she was downloading stuff, I had to lock up her iPad though. But now they can stream as many games as much as they want. This month, Northwest Tel, Northern Canada's major internet provider, introduced unlimited internet to seven communities in the Northwest Territories, Northern BC and the Yukon, including Whitehorse, where Stuart lives. It's full time, man. Like, it's, it's a great thing. So much of 
of the work that we do, even as our service, is reliant on the internet. But 500 kilometers north in Dawson, there's no unlimited internet. Jen Gibbs, who works at the Dawson Women's Shelter, says with COVID restrictions often forcing women to be home with their abuser, reliable internet is crucial. If women don't have access to a crucial tool, like a phone or a, a laptop with internet access, this may create more danger for them. Without unlimited internet, the shelter is forced to restrict access to the many Indigenous women that stay there. So the really unfortunate thing has been that we're just not able to offer our Wi-Fi password to folks um, who are accessing service with us because we're already paying such an astronomically high rate. Another frustration for Gibbs is that Northern Internet costs double, sometimes triple, what most Canadians pay. It's not uncommon that, that we chat with our service users and they say, you know, I'm making a choice between paying my rent, putting food on the table for myself and my kids, uh, or having internet access. Northwest Tel VP Tammy April says high infrastructure costs in the North limits what they can provide. That's a whole lot of, of kilometers that we're covering with fiber and not a lot of people. But Gibbs says everyone should have access to unlimited internet, not just those who can afford it. So much of our, our lives and the business of day-to-day -day existence has shifted to, to online spaces. Northwest Tel says all northern communities they service will have unlimited access by 2023. And TJ Stewart says it's worth the wait. Something to look forward to. I feel bad for them. I really do. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. As some northern communities in Manitoba grapple with cases of COVID-19, one First Nation is doing its best to curb cases of the virus from entering the community as the holidays approach. Students from Puckettawagan have started to return home for the winter break, but not before they have to isolate in the community's school. Frontline workers wanted to make it more comfortable for residents, so they created privacy tents for each person isolating, as well as set up the isolation center with festive decorations like this makeshift Christmas tree. Family and friends pop by for chats through the window. 29 students have gone through the isolation center, and there are no active cases of COVID-19 in the community. Well, that does it for this edition of ABT National News Weekend. We leave you with some visuals of Christmas lights here in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Thank you for joining us. I'm Daryl Stranger. Have a safe and healthy weekend.